Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're being joined by a guest who has a practice known as clean language. This is a certain way of listening and questioning that enables people just like yourself to access your own inner wisdom and foster your own creativity. When clean language is used in a group setting such as school or business, it will enable people to find common understanding, to collaborate respectfully, confront difficult issues, and build group trust. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 Radio program today, trainer of the clean language method, Marion Way. Marion, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, let's talk about what clean language is. I've never heard of anything like this before. Okay, so... um. What it is, is, um, as you've already said, it's a method of communication. It's based on questioning. And it's based on questioning the person's words, their language that they use, and especially the metaphors that they use in everyday speech, such as I'm going around in circles or I'm hitting my head against a brick wall, those kind of things. Um, and, And, or just any word, so I might, uh, ask myself a question about the word question. For example, I can say, is there anything else about that question? And, I can, and then I can answer it, although doing it with yourself is somewhat tricky, especially on the radio. Um, so, th- so it's about clean and, and language. And language is about using the other person's words. And the clean part is about asking questions that will um, contain minimal number of assumptions so that you're not putting your own ideas, assumptions, judgments, thoughts into the communication. You're allowing the other person to explore their own way of thinking, their own way of being, their own way of expressing themselves. Now, how did this uh, clean language come to be developed? It started with a man called David Grove. Um, He was a psychotherapist. And he was also quite innovative in his work and a person who would go to quite extreme lengths to figure out how things worked and what could be done better. And one of the things he did was he studied the client-centered therapists who were around at that time, which was in the 70s and 80s. And he found that although they were client-centered in that the agenda belonged to the client, because they were doing things that we do in everyday um, communication, such as paraphrasing what the person said to check that they understood and summarizing and things like that, they were inadvertently changing the meaning of the person's words. So he started to wonder what it would be like if, instead of changing and paraphrasing and summarizing, he would keep their words intact and just ask them questions about the words that they were using. And what he discovered was that if you do that, the person's attention stays on themselves instead of having to go between the two of you. And they can get in-depth knowledge about what they're talking about just by being asked these simple questions. And the other thing that David did was he was interested in people who had suffered from trauma, and he noticed that quite often they would speak about their trauma using a metaphor, and or maybe not even a metaphor, maybe a gesture, or they might have a nervous tick or something like that. And he wondered what it would be like if instead of treating those metaphors as kind of figures of speech and, and not really real, if he treated them as though they were literal, He wondered what would happen. He started experimenting with that using the clean questions. And what he discovered from that was was that people would have this whole inner world um, of metaphors, symbols, and ideas that were expressed in a sort of, a bit like a dream. Um, You know, when when you have a dream and things aren't quite the same as they are in normal life, um, he, he would be able to go into that world with them ask some questions about it, and from that metaphor and from that understanding that they got from that, things would be able to change and transform. And so because he was talking about clean questions and 
talking about language. He called it clean language. And um, he was developing that during the 1980s and the 1990s. And uh, he went on. After that, he developed another process which he called clean space, which is um, even, even more unusual in that he would encourage a person to find different spaces in a, in a room or outside and to find out what they knew in different spaces. And surprisingly, they knew all sorts of different things if, if they're standing in a corner than if they're standing by the window and if they're standing out in, on the threshold of a door. They would know different things in relation to their topic that they were talking about. So he called that clean space. He then went on to develop another system which he called emergent knowledge. And all these questions had a clean element to them in that he wasn't adding to their content. Um, and the emergent knowledge was repetitive asking of questions in batches of six to find out what would happen if you just kept going. Like I said, he was a bit of a, an experimenter. And then, unfortunately, um, in 2008, he passed away, only 58. And so there are a number of us spread throughout the world who have taken his work and are developing it and using it and training it and doing all sorts of things with it to keep it, to keep it alive because it is absolutely powerful and, and brilliant work. What was it about clean language that attracted you to it? Okay, well, I, was, um, I had already been practicing a type of um, coaching called neuro-linguistic programming, and I attended a conference about that, and there was a speaker at the conference called James Lawley who was um, talking about clean language. And I went along to the talk, and he was talking about a thing called a bind, which is when, when half of you wants to do one thing and half of you wants to do the other, and it's like you've got tied in knots. And I thought, oh, that applies to me. That's, that's how my thinking goes. And so when he asked for somebody to become the demonstration person, I stuck my hand up and he chose me. And um, he, I found out all these things about myself in a very short amount of time that I had no idea existed before that moment. It was so powerful, and I was really hooked on, the, on that first time I, think I experienced it and found out about it. Um, and so I went to see James and his partner Penny, Penny Tompkins, uh, for some therapy, uh, just having discovered what I discovered. And I did a few sessions with them, and then I, you know, I thought, I have to learn how to do this. It's so powerful. And so I went and trained with them. They were writing a book at the time called Metaphors in Mind, which I um, bought and adored and just got into it and eventually gave up my full-time job and started a, a company training other people to use clean language, coaching people, and, I, and now I've written a book as well, So, uh, and I'm writing a second one with James himself about clean space. So um, it's been quite a journey, starting from putting my hand up in a conference room, basically. <laughs> Now, what did you discover about yourself as this inquiry began to happen with you? Oh, well, I discovered um, I discovered that I was actually very resentful of lots of things in my life and um, that when people said or did something that I didn't like, instead of challenging them or doing something about it or letting it go, I would kind of wind it up and I had a little metaphor of a stick and I would put their... Um, the thing on the end of my stick and make it bigger. Um, and that was representing, you know, kind of it going round and round in my mind and thinking of it more and more and more until it was enormous. And when it was really big, it, it, in my metaphor, it turned into the equivalent of a chair or a table. And I would put that chair or table up in an attic and cover it over because I didn't want to think about it and get on with my life. And then somebody else would do something that I didn't like, and that would get wound up into a piece of furniture, and that would go up in the attic, until in the attic, 
there were too many pieces of furniture and it would all come crashing down one day and I would be in a terrible, terrible state, sobbing and crying. And um, I, and then all of this furniture would disappear after that. And then, of course, I would just start it all off again. So I discovered this. And I also discovered that actually if I just flick the, sw flick the stick around the other, other way, so instead of going clockwise, I went anti-clockwise. And that represented just letting it go or going and talking to that person and saying something about it then no pieces of furniture needed to be made and no attic needed to be there. And so, and, and that has held fast for the last 18 years. That was 18 years ago, and, and I don't walk around with a bunch of resentment anymore. So how do you feel something like this actually helped change your life, I guess? Yeah, it has changed my life. Well, I, th I think it's, it, 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 it works through the medium of the metaphor because... Um, with the metaphor, you're, un you're accessing the unconscious mind and you're, you're getting into what's kind of beneath the behaviors and the ideas that you have. You're getting to the core of the problem. And because a metaphor kind of sums something up in a very small number of words uh, or a picture, then it, it's very easy to understand. And because it has a form, it's very easy to change. So, uh, you know, a stick can go one way or the other. And if somebody's depressed and they're under a cloud, you know, the clouds can go along the sky and the sun can come out. Or if they're juggling lots of plates, then those plates can be put down in a pile. So the fact that the, the metaphor has a form means that the, the story, the scene, can change. And when the change happens in the metaphor, then it happens in real life as well because you're working at both levels when you're working with the metaphor. Now, give um, us an idea of what you mean by metaphor for listeners that may not be familiar with yeah, that and how this well, really clearly expresses what we're really saying, as you said, on a subconscious level. Yeah, so, well, those that I've just said, you know, we talk about being under a cloud when things aren't going so well. We talk about, um, we might talk about um, jumping for joy, and quite often we don't actually mean we're jumping it's just an expression. Uh, we talk about, um, you know, in the newspapers every day, there's, there are metaphors about, oh, I can't think of any right now, but they're, they're abundant in our, in our speech and, um, you know, juggling, juggling too many plates. Um, let me just uh, think, see if I can think of one that's not one that I've said already. We talk about going on a journey when we don't mean getting in a car or going on a plane. We mean going on, on a journey in our mind, maybe, or going on a journey because we've embarked on a new, um, learning a new skill. Or we talk about, um, we, we, we talk about people pouring out their, their troubles, and we don't really mean that they've got a jug and they're pouring something we mean metaphorically. So any time that we're using something that is a kind of real thing... Sort of like water under the bridge, in other words. Yeah, water <laughs> under the bridge would be another one. Yeah, so any time we're talking about... We're using real things in the real world to talk about ideas, then we're probably using a metaphor. Um, so... Um, and, and some of them are very, very obvious, like being under a cloud or water under a bridge, or hitting my head against a brick wall. And some of them are going to be less obvious. So if we talk about being in love, now that little word in, doesn't, we're not in anything. So that little word in means, is a metaphor in, in, a, in a kind of way, much less obvious than the ones I've been talking about until now, but still a metaphor. Or we might say, I jumped to a conclusion. Well, we didn't jump anywhere, so that jump is a metaphor. Or um, I need to get over that relationship. The get over, again, we're not, we're not getting over anything real, so the get over is metaphorical. And we use, the, we use metaphor 
both the obvious ones and the less obvious ones all the time as we're speaking. Um, there's an estimate that it's about six per minute per person. Some people may be a bit less, some context may be a bit less, but some people use a lot more than that. And clean language is about picking up on those little words and asking questions and very simple questions like what kind of get over is that get over? Is there anything else about that in when you're in love? Um, whereabouts is that get over? And just questions like that, that that people start to think about in a, in a different way and they start to enter into their own, the structure of their own thinking. And uh, it's like going through, here's a metaphor of mine, like going through a doorway or a portal into another another way of thinking, another world where you've you've got your reality but structured in pictures or sounds or however you do your thinking. So I, I guess a good way we can probably maybe do a little bit of an experiment here on the program where perhaps you can kind of go through questions uh, and clean language with me and give yeah. the listeners an idea of how this actually works. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So um, how about we have how about you have a little thing? Because you have to have a topic for clean language. Otherwise, you haven't got anything to ask about. So how about if we had as a topic when you are interviewing at your best? How would that work for you? That, that would be fine. Great. So when you're interviewing at your best, you're like what? When I'm interviewing at my best, I'm like something is flowing through me. You know, working oh. through me, in other words. Something is flowing through you. Yes, that something is working through me. It's sort of like I lose myself and I find myself all at the same time. Oh. Something's flowing through you, something's working through you, and you lose yourself and you find yourself all at the same time. And when something is flowing through, what kind of something could that be? I guess it would be an energy. Hmm be an energy. And is there anything else about that energy when it's flowing through you? It's more like something kind of takes you over. You know, you know you're doing the action, the interviewing, whatever the case may be, but at the same time it's like you're possessed. <laughs> so something takes you over and you're doing the interview and at the same time you're possessed. And is there anything else about that possessed? That's an interesting question, possessed. Like something's taking me over, uh, taking mm. control, I guess. Mm. And is that the same something that's flowing through or, or something different? Hmm. I guess it would be a little bit different than flowing through. You know, it kind of comes in and takes me over and, and there I am doing my thing. Mm. It comes in and it takes you over and there you are doing your thing. And when it comes in, where does it come in from? That's a good question. I kind of think of it like, uh, I guess, for using a yoga term, my crown chakra. <laughs> Your crown chakra. Ah. And is there anything else about that coming in when it comes in through your crown chakra? Well, it's a feeling like perhaps I've opened up to allow something to come in and say, hey, let's go do this together, sort of a mm. thing. So you've opened up to allow that thing to come through, and let's go do this together. And when you've opened up, is there anything else about that open up? It just seems expansive. Mm, and it's expansive. And you open up and it's expansive. And what happens just before you open up? Well, you, I feel like I'm there, like I'm present. And then all of a sudden something just opens up and it just, there, it's like a free feeling, a free fall mm. feeling, I guess. Mm. So you're present, and then all of a sudden something opens up and it's a free-falling feeling. And you open up and you allow something in, and it's like something takes you over and you're possessed. And it's flowing through and it's working through, and you lose yourself and you find yourself. Is there anything else about lose myself? Um, I think it might be losing an old way of experience. Like there might have been an intention, for instance, let's say I would be interviewing you and I had an intentional way of 
specific questions that I wanted to ask, uh, a way that I wanted to guide the conversation to a, sp a specific end goal, but what I'm doing now with this allowing is I let it go and just kind of let it run its own course, its own natural course. Mm. So you, you, let way, you let go of the old way and you let this run its own natural course. And you find yourself. And what kind of find myself is that? Well, it's exciting because of allowing that you now would experience something in a different way that you wouldn't have had you intended or, let's say, forced it to go in another direction. Mm. So it's exciting. And you're experiencing yourself in a different way than if you'd gone in a different direction. And when all of that and there's something flowing through and something taking over and it's opening up through your crown chakra coming in and all of a sudden that opens up and you lose yourself and you find yourself and letting go and letting it run. Is there anything else about all of that? Well, I guess it's just exciting because you feel a sense of growth and enlightenment through it. Mm. It's exciting and growth and enlightenment. And is there anything else about growth than enlightenment? I guess the only thing I can think of is that it allows you to be more open and receptive to what life brings or has in store for you. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to be open and receptive. And is that within the interview or in anywhere else? I think it's just overall you, how your perception can change. Mm, you that's know. overall. Mm -hmm. so, within in, so within the interview, there's something flowing uh, and working through, and it's exciting, and, you, and there's growth and enlightenment, and that's overall. And when in the interview, and you open up and you allow um, something to come through and to be possessed, and you let go of your old way and you run with it, then what happens? Well, I suppose I look forward to the next time that happens. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and what's happening right now? Well, it's that same way, kind of learning about yourself, I guess. Mm. And you're learning about yourself. And is this an okay place to stop? Oh, absolutely. This, this little bit, I mean, of asking you questions. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. So how was that for you? Well, it was uh, like I said, it was interesting because you don't think about it like that before. You know, it feels exciting, like how did I do that or what just happened, how, <clears throat> you know, as I said, you lose yourself and you find yourself. And you realize, I know I just did that, but it was like something working through me and it was very exciting when you allow that to happen. Mm. Mm. And, so, and has it given you a bit more of an insight into what clean language is? Absolutely. I can see how that works now. Yeah. Okay. So that's what it's like. Okay. So um, shall I hand the interview back to you? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being asked questions. I always find it's always, you know, kind of neat to be sort of a guest, if you will, and be asked questions from time yeah. to time. But I understand that this is something that you can apply in places such as business and schools. How is that effective? Let's say, for instance, in schools. Okay, well, in, um, in schools, this is something that you can do one-to-one -one with anyone. Um, when they've got a little problem, if you meet a child, if, you know, if imagining you're a teacher and you meet a child in the corridor who's got a problem, you can ask them a few questions to help them unpick what's going on for them and sort it out. And you can use this with whole groups of people in business in schools. And um, a friend of mine called... Julie McCracken, who also has a book which is called Clean Language in the Classroom, has got lots of stories of using this in, in school when she was a teacher. One of my favorite ones is she asked, um, she asked everyone in the classroom to think about, a bit like I did with you just now, when, but instead of when they're interviewing at their best, she asked when you're learning at your best, you're like what? And the children who were five, six, and seven uh, came up with their images of what they were like, and they, 
they were some of them were like a caterpillar and some of them were like a rainbow and some of them were like I don't know all different all different things and they um, drew pictures of them and coloured them in and cut them all out and then somehow uh, negotiated using a few clean questions to how this would be on a wall hanging. So they made a wall hanging and they're saying, well, you know, the grasshopper needs to be near the ground and then there's a rainbow that's got to be up in the sky. So they, they worked out how all these symbols would be able to kind of live together on one wall hanging. And then they worked out what that would mean for them in their real life, in their classroom. And somebody who likes jumping around quite a lot, who's perhaps a grasshopper, um, would sit quite a long way away from somebody who likes to be quiet and so on. And they, they negotiated their whole classroom to be how they needed it to be for them to learn at their best. And then Julie would, um, and she would use clean language in all of her lessons to help them um, to, if they drew a picture, she would get them to ask each other questions. So where does that come from? And they would find out a little bit more about what they'd drawn in their picture and if they were doing handwriting, she'd get them to work out the um, the criteria for success in a handwriting lesson, again, using clean questions. So she did a lot of work using these questions. And then if the class um, got a little bit noisy one time and they weren't doing what they were, what, you know, the work that they, they'd been set, she would look at them and she'd say, so when... Um, this is you learning at your best, and she'd point to the wall chart. So what needs to happen for that to happen? And they would all look at the wall chart and then go, oh, yeah, we're supposed to, that's, that's me. I'm supposed to be a grasshopper now. I'm supposed to be a rainbow. And they would get back into the good state that was elicited through the, the original work that she had done with them, and, uh, and the class could carry on working smoothly again. And she, this book is full of stories like that that she tells about how she uses clean language in, in the classroom to do all, all sorts of things. Um, so a so very, very powerful tool for, for teachers. And we're, we're doing quite a lot of work in schools using clean language um, and with young people to help them get back into work so that they, they get to know themselves and they get to know what kind of job they want, what, what will work best for them by using clean language together with a a few other little um, self-discovery tools, but with clean language at the heart. So there's lots of work that you can do with young people using these questions. Sounds amazing, certainly from the experience that I had as well. Is there a book you had mentioned uh, that people can find out, you know, how they can understand this and learn how it works, things like that? Yeah, so I've mentioned a couple of books already. There's one called Metaphors in Mind by Penny Tompkins and James Lawley. There's Julie's book, which is called Clean Language in the Classroom. My book is called Clean Approaches for Coaches. And um, that's, on, that's on sale on my website, which is called cleanlearning.co.uk. Um, and another book that I heartily recommend is by Caitlin Walker. It's called From Contempt to Curiosity. Because what these questions do is they engender a sense of curiosity in people. So instead of um, thinking somebody's being silly or um, you know, judging them, find out what's really going on for them because it, it's generally not what you think. <laughs> well, not <laughs> um, the truth. <laughs> and get to know them, yeah. And right. so the questions are about being curious. So this, From Contempt to, Be From Contempt to Curiosity, is a great book for um, finding out how you can use clean language in lots and lots of different contexts with, with groups. Very interesting work here, Mary, and I want to thank you for taking the time to present this on our program here today. If you could, for our listeners, one more time, go ahead and give out that website where they can find out more. Yes, yeah, so uh, can I give out two? So there's one which is um, cleanlearning.co.uk, because I'm probably, you can all tell from my accent, located in um, England. And every year I come to Portland in Oregon, and we have a website there which is called cleaninportland.com. Well, very good. Marion, thank you so much for being on the program today. What a delight. You are more than welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. 
We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>